The FBI considered Irving Ash Resnick to be the Patriarchum Mob's man in Las Vegas. Resnick was a former college and professional basketball player. After his release from the U.S. Army after the war, he was deeply involved with gambling operations and then moved to Las Vegas in 1949. He was a central figure at many of the city's hotels' operations, most notably at the Dunes where he was officially a host but set up different types of gambling revenues for special customers. He was also the sports coordinator. It was Resnick who brought boxing to the casino and booked Floyd Patterson to do his fight workouts there as well. Over time, he was involved with the Caesars Palace, the Tropicana, El Rancho, and the Thunderbird where he apparently worked directly for Lansky while the little man was at the Thunderbird and Maxim Hotels. On May 19, 1972, FBI report from the Los Angeles field office to Hoover stated that Resnick had major mob ties with New Jersey and Brooklyn figures and indicated his reach went beyond the ring. At one point in his career in Las Vegas, Resnick raised the ire of Lansky partner Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo when Resnick worked for them at the casino. One day Allo was looking for Resnick and couldn't find him only to find out that Resnick was running his own bookmaking operation around the pool at the high-end apartment building, the Blair House. Allo sent some people over to the apartment building to tell Resnick, you better start doing your work for us in 1974. Resnick was convicted of tax evasion in connection with an alleged skimming of 300000 which the U.S. government said Resnick took from the Caesars Palace Hotel's casino without paying taxes. The conviction was later overturned. Later that year, he survived an attempt on his life when eight sticks of dynamite were found under his car. The guy who put the bomb there was Charles Bernstein, a former St. Louis gambler and fence, also known as Chucky Burns. He was arrested for placing the bomb and put under house arrest on a $75,000 bond. At the time, he was wanted for five years sentencing for a 1969 burglary conviction in Missouri. No one is certain why the bomb was placed under his car, but as one mobbed up Las Vegas regular put it so something happened, okay. I don't know what it is. To bomb somebody or to kill somebody, you got to do something pretty bad. You know, not just grabbing something out of the skim that day, once, but maybe on a continual basis or whatever. I don't know what it is, or maybe steering people away from a deal. Ash did something to either mess up a deal or take advantage of something that he shouldn't have taken advantage of. The scuttlebutt was that the orders came down from Anthony Giordano, boss of the St. Louis crime family. Giordano had a lot going on in Las Vegas at that time. In 1972, he was convicted of illegally skimming gambling proceeds from the Aladdin Hotel and Casino in Paradise, Nevada, through the Emprise Corporation with Michael Big Mike Polizzi and Anthony Tony Z. Zarilli, members of the Detroit organization. In 1975, Giordano was convicted on charges of secretly trying to obtain ownership in the New Frontier Hotel in Paradise, Nevada, and was sent to prison in that case. He was released in 1977. At the time, Resnick was in charge of credit to gamblers at the Caesars Palace operation. A policeman from Kansas City tipped off the Las Vegas police that an attempt might be made on Resnick's life. The cops were able to convince Bernstein to accept a police-made dummy bomb instead of an eight-stick dynamite bomb that had been prepared. The police then videotaped the scene as Bernstein hooked up the dummy bomb to Resnick's car in a Las Vegas parking lot on January 5th. In an odd twist of things, the Resnick home was later purchased by Frank Rosenthal. Like Resnick, Rosenthal was also a mafia bombing target. Two years later, in 1976, it was said that he survived a second attack on his life when he was shot while leaving Caesar's Palace. This writer could not find any proof that the shooting happened. Resnick and Liston became close after Resnick made himself indispensable to Liston while he trained for the Ali fight at the Thunderbird. Resnick would hang out with the boxer and buy him clothes and other items. Resnick was also close to former heavyweight champion Joe Lewis, who would later become close to Liston. According to the FBI, Resnick used Lewis as a bodyguard companion and enforcer on collection calls. Resnick and Liston were two very different people. The college-educated Resnick came from comfortable surroundings in a Jewish home in New York. Liston was born in Forest City, Arkansas, possibly in the early 1930s. The day and year are unknown. 
He was the 24th child of A, as Liston said, a miserable miscreant sharecropper father. Liston was forced to work from a young age to help feed his father's 25 children. He had no formal education at all. He could sign his name but could not write his own address. We hardly had enough food to keep from starving, no shoes, only a few clothes, and nobody to help us escape from the horrible life we lived, he would later say. We grew up like heathens. He came to St. Louis as a teen and began robbing restaurants and gas stations. His criminal record included breaking a policeman's leg. In another incident, he started a fight with a cop, beat the cop senseless, snatched his gun, picked him up, and dumped him in an alley. He then walked away smiling, wearing the cop's hat. He was convicted of armed robbery when he was about 22. He was sent to Missouri State Penitentiary, where his natural athleticism and talent for fighting were soon spotted by Father Alloy Stevens, a Catholic priest who also ran the prison gym. After two years in jail, he was freed on parole and took up professional boxing in 1953. He won 32 of his first 33 bouts. His eventual record was 50 wins and 4 losses with 39 knockouts, but Liston was like a rain cloud over the sport. He was said to have worked as a bodyguard, driver, and leg breaker for mobster John Vitale in St. Louis. In the early days of his professional career, he was managed by Frank Blinky Palermo and mafioso Frankie Carbo. New York Times columnist Arthur Daly wrote Liston is arrogant, surly, mean, rude, and altogether frightening. He's the last man anyone would want to meet in a dark alley. By 1962, he was ready to go for the World Heavyweight Championship against Floyd Patterson, whom he easily defeated. When he fought Patterson for the title, even President John F. Kennedy urged Patterson to find an opponent, as Kennedy put it, a better character. Nineteen months later, Liston's managers put him up against Muhammad Ali. The fight was scheduled in Miami in February of 1964. Liston was a heavy favorite and trained at the Thunderbird Hotel Casino in Las Vegas. In an FBI memo sent to J. Edgar Hoover marked secret, dated May 24th, 1966, details of an FBI interview with a Houston gambler named Barnett Magids, who described to agents his discussions with Resnick before the first Clayliston fight. About a week before the fight, Magids called Resnick at the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami and asked Resnick who he liked in the fight, and Resnick said that Liston would not clay out in the second round. Resnick suggested he wait until just before the fight to place any bets because the odds may come down. The report reads, at about noon on the day of the fight, Majid's reached Resnick again by phone, and at this time, Resnick said for him to not make any bets, but just go watch the fight on pay TV, and he would know why, and that he could not talk further at that time. Majid's did go see the fight on TV, and immediately realized that Resnick knew that Liston was going to lose, the document states. A week later, there was an article in Sports Illustrated writing up Resnick as a big loser because of his backing of Liston. Later people in the know in Las Vegas told Magids that Resnick and Liston both reportedly made over 1 million betting against Liston on the fight and that the magazine article was a cover for this. One theory is that Resnick fixed the Liston Ali fight by making a deal with the Nation of Islam, of which Ali was a member, to have Liston take a dive in exchange for a percentage of Ali's future earnings. At the time, the world didn't know Ali was a devout member of the Nation of Islam. Many think the Nation of Islam threatened Liston to throw the fight, but it's more likely that he had an interest, with Resnick and others, in throwing the match. Liston told Nevada State Assemblyman Gene Collins that he had a portion of Ali's contract as part of his payoff for taking a dive in the fight. The theory was that a doctor who owed the mob a fortune in gambling debts injected anesthetic into Liston's shoulder before the fight and then physically dislocated the area. Tendons were damaged and Liston failed to come out for the fifth round. The Miami Beach Boxing Commission doctor reportedly diagnosed a torn tendon in Liston's left shoulder. Florida State Attorney Richard Gerstein conducted a post-fight investigation, which concluded that Liston went into the fight with a bad shoulder. He determined there was no evidence that the fight was not completely regular, according to the Palm Beach Post. Miami Beach Boxing Chairman Morris Klein said commissioners were satisfied that there was no wrongdoing and allowed Liston to collect his $370,000 purse. 
A U.S. Senate subcommittee conducted hearings three months later but found no evidence of a fixed fight. By the late 1960s, Liston was using heroin and had become an enforcer for a drug dealer named Robert Chetnik who was a famous jazz trumpet player known by his stage name, Red Rodney. In February 1969, Liston was at the home of a beautician and drug dealer named Earl Cage when it was raided by the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs and the Las Vegas Police. Everyone was arrested except for Liston, who was mysteriously released at the scene. Word of the raid got back to Chetnik, who started to believe Liston was untrustworthy and told his son Mark to stop dealing with him. But while Chetnik was out of town for a gig, Liston came to his house looking for drugs. Chudnik's son was home and tried to turn Liston away, but Liston barged in and searched the house, slamming the teen against the wall before leaving. That happened in late 1970. On January 5, 1971, Liston's wife, Geraldine, flew home from a New Year's trip to find the boxer lying bloody against the bed, blood covering an undershirt that barely covered his bloated body. He had been dead for several days. According to a Las Vegas police report, she first called her lawyer and then tried desperately to reach a doctor. When one finally arrived, he could do little more than confirm what she already knew. Why he died remains one of sport's most enduring mysteries. It was well after midnight when the police arrived at the Liston house, which sat in an affluent suburb called Paradise Palms. The doorstep was cluttered with several days' worth of unopened milk bottles as well as a stack of unread Las Vegas Sun newspapers, which investigators would later use to determine the exact day Liston had died. Several windows had been left open, but this did little to ease the stench of death in the house. When police arrived at the scene, they found three small bags of heroin on the kitchen counter. A small amount of marijuana was found in his pocket. Also, a syringe was found near his body. Based on evidence at the scene, police believe that he died on December 30, 1970. An autopsy discovered needle marks on his right arm. The official report stated that he had died of a cardiac arrest after injecting himself with heroin. However, there was only small amounts of heroin found in his body. It did not appear to be an overdose death. A month before his death, Sonny was injured in a car accident. He received IV treatment at the hospital, which is where he may have received the needle marks. However, according to those who knew him, Sonny did not like needles and would refuse to go to the doctor to get shots. They find it unlikely that he would inject himself with drugs. Some believe that on the night of his death, he was given a drug drink and was later taken to his home where he was given the fatal injection. Sergeant Dennis Caputo was one of the first officers to arrive. The call came over dispatch and we were aware that it was the Liston residence, but in Las Vegas it wasn't unusual to get high-profile calls like that. For me, it wasn't a big deal. It was a very nice house. Well-kept and orderly. I got the feeling it hadn't been lived in too much. There was nothing to suggest, at least on first sight, that something sinister may have happened. There were no apparent signs of forced entry, no visible weapons, and no signs of a struggle. Inside the master bedroom, he found a small bag of marijuana and a glass of vodka alongside Liston's prone corpse. He was wearing a t-shirt and boxer shorts and was in a state of decomposition. There were no visible wounds and no weapons were found. The kitchen was spotless except for a penny balloon on the counter. It was common knowledge that these kind of balloons were used to transport illegal narcotics. I will also say that it was pretty well known that Liston was a part-time user. Geraldine and her attorney were in the house for an unknown period of time before we arrived. I did find it odd that she called her attorney when the body was discovered rather than the police. His body was bloated, he had been dead for at least six days, and there was dried blood streaking from his nose. Liston's body was eventually moved into a waiting ambulance. His vast weight proved too much and he was dropped several times. It was an undignified exit, reminiscent of a felled boxer being carried out of the ring. An initial autopsy found the cause of death inconclusive, noting only that it may have been related to heroin. Traces of morphine and codeine of a type commonly produced by the breakdown of heroin had been in Liston's system. But there was not enough of it to definitively state that he had died of an overdose. 
Officially, the Clark County coroner ruled that the boxer died of natural causes, specifically lung congestion and heart failure. In 1982, a police informant named Erwin Peters said Larry Gandy, a retired Vegas cop revered by everyone in the department, had become a burglar. He said Gandy had killed Liston on behalf of Ash Resnick after Resnick and the boxer battled over money. A police sting proved at least some of Peter's information to be true. Gandy had become a thief and was caught in the act and arrested. Grandy was one of the officers called to the crime scene as Liston's home. Gandy was eventually convicted and handed a 10-year sentence which was suspended. Gandy denied killing Liston but said the prime suspect in Liston's murder was Earl Cage, the beautician dealer who suspected Liston had set him up for arrest. Resnick died in 1989 of heart failure.